Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another video. Uh, we're going to have an interesting one today. It's uh, about the development of harmonic analysis. I'm going to go right back to the start, my friends. OK, so get strapped in. I don't know how long this video is going to take because I'm just going to I've, I've prepared, but I don't know how long it's going to take. I've got some musical examples to break it up. I've got some scores, some sheet notation, and we're just going to deal with the very early period. So if you're a person that's you like to know the underlying structure of things. So yes, we're into music and it's all great, but we need the underlying structure. We will be able to understand this picture uh, by the end of this. This is going to be the, only the first video. I'm hopefully going to make a couple of more videos ex ex to explain one, how I perceive harmonic analysis as an electronic musician. So as a more modern approach to electronic music or you know, slightly more modern. It's very ancient in a way, but more modern in some ways. OK, so that's what we're going to do. We're looking at harmonic analysis and this is my representation of it. OK, we got the thinker here. We got uh, the original mammoth bone flute that we're going to talk about in, in a minute. He's thinking about it. We get some FFT. We get some organs out of it. We get uh, harmonics and spectrum and it all we crunches down into some score and uh, staff notation. That took a while. So that took about 2,000 years to get, well, it took about 40,000 years to get from here to here. All right. That took about 40,000 years. So a lot of thinking. So that, so I don't know how long this video is going to take, but hopefully not too long. Okay. So I'm going to turn it off now and turn that picture off and we're going to get r stuck right in. Okay. So this is the most important part of history for me, all of history. It's this flute. All of human thinking, everything in my mind is reduced down to this flute. This is the very first point of human communication. OK, so this is one of the things that I'm going to talk about when we're communicating about harmonicity and music. That music is ultimately a form of communication. OK, I think I might have some interesting things about that later on. I hope so. I hope I kept them. So what we're looking at here is it we know it's carbon dated to at least older than 35,000 years. So they've used carbon dating and they can find that it's older than that. So they reckon about 43,000 years, okay? So we can see it. It's clearly a flute. You know, it's you could play it. You could pick it up and play it. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play a, a, a video of this man here. I think his name is, I don't know what his name is, I don't want to say his name wrong. So we'll just play it, we can hear it. So that's the sound of 40,000 years ago, approximately. We can see the holes, they were, they were divided to make a diatonic scale My or pentatonic was scale. arrested by an article a few years ago about an ice age flute found in a cave in Germany. See the curve on it, like that's clearly designed 40,000 years ago. It was apparently ago. the first humans that had arrived in that area and um, they found it in layers of mammoth uh, relics. And when they put it all together, I think it was maybe in 12 different pieces. That's not it. They were able to study Well, there's different it ones. There's ivory and, ones. Uh, and get an idea of what it's... So in time, what I did was I stretched it into a lower instrument. No, I think any changed it. It's clearly different. So that's not the way it sounded at all. But whatever. You know, there's Eric. He's you know, trying to make a bit of cash. But it's 40,000 years ago. Now, what people have argued... Uh, is that it provides for survival of the fittest. That, 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 that it's a so humans who had music had community. You know, they could use it as a form of communication and as a social signifier and that ancient flutes were evidence for early music traditions and likely helped modern humans communicate, form tighter social bonds, the researchers argue. And so one of my favourite arguments for that is a, a, a psychologist called, a neurologist called Oliver Sacks. OK, so that's where it started. 40,000 years ago. So what that means is that their culture would be very different for for me. I'm going to explain harmonicity in a very profound way, my friends. I can't help it. So 
What that means is that I could go back in time. Their culture would be very different. They wouldn't understand what I did, the mathematics, the language, the cultures, the customs, the clothing. They wouldn't understand any of that, you know, none of it. But I could, I could hum a tune, you know, and, you know, an alarm, an alert, it's going to sound the same. Humans will respond very similarly, uh, the body physically, to stimuli. And that's what we're dealing with. That's a more modern interpretation of what music is. A response to external auditory stimulus, uh, if from my perspective, that produces involuntary uh, 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 autonomic ex um, feelings. So physical, you know, you feel good if you listen to music or you feel sad. It makes you feel something. So that's the human part of it. So I'm sorry if there's a little bit profound but that that's the first instrument so f i could go back in time forty thousand years and communicate successfully with humans okay so i'm trying to show you that from my perspective hu uh, music is is primary it's a primary form of in, in, uh, higher than words i'll explain that in a minute now hopefully so this is an airy poem and we're going to look at this a little bit okay so this is a very first poem on music uh, uh, if I can find it here now, it's uh, music by Sophocles. So we're getting into the Greek territory and we're going to start talking about early music theory, okay? By memory's daughters, the muses, forgetting named lithe, is hated and not to be loved. Oh, for mortals, what power is there in songs? What greatest happiness that can make bearable this short, narrow channel of life? Okay, so let's not forget and let's preserve our songs and let's preserve our cultures. So that's the argument there. Lithe is the god of forgetfulness. So if we scroll on, we're just going to learn a little bit about this uh, Sophocles person and the Ode to Man. And we can see that it was 500 BC. OK, so it's and this is where it was put on. It's quite the show. I mean, if you were a show right there right now, you'd be doing well. You'd be like, right, that's a lot of people to feast. You know? <laughs> I hope it's a good show. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit and I'm just going to read Ode to Man, which you may know um, from Mozart, um, it, it, which is the national anthem for the Europe, European Union, is Ode to Man. Uh, Wonders on earth are many, but none is more formidable than man. He traverses the waves driven by the winds of the storm and leaves his wake in a surge that could overwhelm him. He drags his plough across the ground, the ancient immortal earth, and year upon year he turns the unwearied soil with beasts of burden. Birds fly carefree on high, wild animals stalk the forests, fish teem in deep seas. Of all these, the master is man. Man who surpasses all in the acuity of his mind. By their arts, human beings have subdued, subdued the beasts whose homes is in the wilds, who roam over the hills. By their ingenuity, they have tamed the rough-maned horse and put a halter on its neck. By their skill, they have mastered the unwearied mountain bull. Men have devised the arts of language, and their thought is as swift as the wind. They have built nations and established laws. Man can withstand the arrows of frost and the rushing rain that hurtles down from the open sky. Truly, human beings have resourcefulness in all things and are never at a loss in the face of all they encounter. For one thing alone, for death, there is no cure nor remedy at hand. Those For sickness, even those that cannot be cured, human beings have contrived a relief. Wondrous beyond measure is the mind that brings man both to sadness and to joy. When a person applies the laws of the earth and the justice that the gods have sworn to uphold, his status in the city is high. Outcast from the city is he with whom the lawbreakers consorts in both in his bold villainy. May such a one never sit at my hearth or be party to my goodwill. Interesting. There's an interesting line in there, my friends. Though for sickness, even those that cannot be cured, human beings have contrived relief. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you understand that. Anyways, let's continue. So we can see here a little bit more. I apologise now if that sounds a little bit, but I'm thinking about multiple thoughts, you know. And uh, it's an interesting period of life. So what we're going to listen to here now is a little bit of the or uh, the Orlis. So this would have been their instrument of time. So we may as well just have a quick listen to it and uh, hear what it sounds like, okay? 
I wish I could find a little bit. It might be on here in a little bit. So I'll just pull back. We listen to a, a Greek instrument and the tuning of it. So this instrument was associated with Dionysus, the god of theatre, as well of wine and ecstasy. Not the lyre, but the aurelis. This double pipe thing. I think we see someone playing later on, so I might just show you that one. Okay, so we're going to watch this now. This is We're going to read a little bit about this. This is an interesting book, Sound, Sense and Music in Greek Poetry. So anything that, anything that involves sound and the senses, I'm in. Okay, so that that's psychoacoustics. So that's I, that's where I enjoy finding out about. So until the fifth century BC, all Greek poets. This is so interesting. All Greek poets made their poems for hearing, not for seeing. So again, this the reason I'm reading this is because I think primarily we are musical beings. We are not language beings, and the problems that very many of us are having in school that are of a certain type of intelligence, a certain type of cognitive style, is that we we are this way. We're like we're musical beings. So I'll try and explain what this means in this in this sentence, uh, or a part of it at least. Under the fifth cent- until the fifth century BC, all Greek poets made their poems for hearing, not for seeing, for the ear and not for the eye. Poetry was social rather than private, being usually sung, recited, or performed at religious ceremonies, festivals, feasts, or entertainments. Even when the Greeks began to read poetry privately for themselves, Euripides in the f- is the first professor of a private library. They read it aloud. Not silently, as we generally do. Silent reading of literature as dis- is a distinct for- from business documents is clearly not attested until the 4th century. So this is the part I want to get you to, OK? In other words, the physical material of ancient Greek poetry, the stuff out of which it was composed and experienced, was primarily and essentially sounds not visual sounds, vibrations in the air caused by vocal organs, not black marks written on white pages by pens. The alphabet was a mnemonic device for indicating what sounds a reader should make. It was like musical notation, not a series of pictorial symbols like Egyptian hieroglyphs or Chinese ideograms. Isn't that fascinating? Who would have thought of the alphabet as being like musical notation? And of course it is. It, it you know, alpha, alphabet, you know. So, so yeah, it's incredible. I really like that uh, sentence and it kind of, you know, it helps me out in my way of thinking about it. So what I'm going to do now is, which, oh no, I was probably on a page there. That was kind of good. I should have read it. I need to go back and see what page we're on here. What are we looking at? Oh, I don't think I got anything out of this book. I was looking through this book and I don't think I got anything out of it, so... I do like the first line, though. The ability to keep time must be possessed by every musician as if he was performed intelligently. So there's very... So I suppose what we could talk about here is that there's very little on timing in early Greek music. So the music was... The timing was kept by the lyrics. So some of the timing is lost because some of the languages are lost, so some of the metres of the words are lost. But that's how the timing was written down. And there's no kind of rhythmic timing until much later. Oh, we're going to see him in a minute, <laughs> right? Here's another little thought I want you to tell you about. So, so the idea earlier on where we said, and they had contrived a relief for pain, OK? This is important. There's many types of pain, OK? So we're going to look at this, the ethical use of music. Both the ancient Chinese and Greeks from around the 5th century BC to around the 3rd century AD recognised the immense impact that music had on the development of one's personality and both regarded excuse me and both regarded it as crucial in the cultivation for the proper disposition in the youth. Music's power over one's ethos that is, human disposition, was emphasised by Plato and the Chinese authors of various documents. As will become clear, music in both cultures was considered an important means for proper education and a powerful tool for, here's important, cultivating and controlling the people of a nation-state. In both cases, by the senses, you know, you can be cultivated and controlled by your senses. 
in both cases, the power of music was further connected to the way the universe works. So we're going to see that again and again. Uh, yet despite their similar views about music, the reasoning uh, strategies used in the two cultures differed enormously, observing how the two... So, so that's all I wanted to take from this, was that in both of these ancient cultures, they saw music as being educational to the mind which is also her back, so we're just going to see that again and again and again. And I personally believe that this is missing in education, it's missing in the modern world. So that's that's my belief, you know, I, I can prove it, I think. So what I'm going to do now... Oh, he's looking up at a bit her, 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 So, yeah, no, this is, this is great. What we're going to do now is we're going to start looking into the more modern theory of analysis, the mathematical principles behind music and where it came from. And Pythagoras is a very... He's a great signifier. He, in, in, he's literally the man behind the curtain. He literally had a curtain. He told lies. He kept hidden truths, apocryphal truths. He was, a, a, he was an unusual figure at the time. And he's still an unusual figure. And you still have to, you know, anyways. So Pythagoras was, you know, he was a, he was a, he was a bit of a genius and he travelled around the world. He, he involved himself in very many rituals and he thought about very, very many things. And uh, he, 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 was, he started what we would say a rational viewpoint of the world. He, he answered a particular question. Can we know anything for sure? And he said, yes, we can. Although the world is in eternal flux... This is what Heraclitus said, the world is on fire, we can know nothing. There's no, everything is just changeable, there's no, don't bother, just go off and fish or whatever. Pythagoras said, no, there are things that we can be known. So this is what philosophy is. He's the first philosopher. He, dis he came up with the word to describe himself. He said, I'm a lover of knowledge, philosophia. So Pythagoras is the first philosopher and he introduced uh, rational thought, numbers, harmonic alignment. So he introduced that to the world. So for up until the 1500s, if you were educated at all, you were educated in, by, by, in Pythagoras, Plato and Aristotle and a few other people. But Pythagoras, he, he just to explain wh what he did to the world, he said that number, the concept of number, he worshipped it. He was a num numerologist, really. And he worshipped numbers. And he said that n n the number in the planets, numbers could be seen in the heavens by the movement of the planets. So that's called orbital mechanics. We're going to see that later, okay? He said number is observable on the plane through geometry. So he came up with, um, well, he codified uh, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, the, the triangle. And then he said... Number is music in the soul. So, so, so if you well-ordered music will create a well-ordered soul. Okay? So that's what Bach believed as well. And this is a fundamental belief of about music that's completely forgotten. It's not known these days. So if you're listening to this video, then you're one of the very few people in the world that know that so, but sure who listens to this video of course only only us lunatics okay so let's carry on with our lunatic video uh, further so we're going to look at Pythagoras now and what he did and this is the story behind it okay uh, he was thinking of all the of all the Pythagoras' rep reputed achievements because he had a school so how much is him and how much is the school the most persistent and richly attested are those in music he above invented quotation, music by determining the ratios of musical concords. A deflatious, that means bullcrappy, event is said to have occurred by chance one day as Pythagoras passed a blacksmith uh, shop, the blacksmith arts. Uh, Nicomus of Gerasaya, I don't know, in his Harmonicon, oh, okay, tells the, tells the tale. One day he, Pythagoras, was deep in thought and seriously considering whether it could be possible to devise some kind of instrumental aid for the ears, which would be firm and unerring, such as a sight obtains through the compass and ruler, or the surveyor's instruments, or touch obtains with the balance or device of measures, 
While thus engaged, he walked by a smithy and by divine chance heard the hammers beating out iron on the anvil and mixedly giving off sounds which were most harmonious with one another, except for one combination. He recognised in those these sounds the consonants of the octave, the fifth and the fourth, but he perceived that the interval between the fourth and the fifth was dissonant in itself, but otherwise complementary to the greater of these two consonants. I'll explain this in a minute, don't worry. The complementary of these two consonances. And delighted, therefore, he ran into the smithy and found by various experiments that the differences of sound arose from the weight of the hammers, but not the force of the blows, nor from the shape of the hammers, nor from the alteration of the iron being forged. Having carefully examined the weights of the hammers and the impacts were identical, he departed to his home. So what he's shown here is that Pythagoras confirmed his discovery by plucking on string which is attached to weights of equal to those of four hammers. So six, eight, nine and twelve suspended. So he started the experiment with suspended strings and he, he basically found out that if you pluck a string of half the length you get the octave. Now what I'm going to do real quickly my friends, I'm going to have to... Uh, Show live now, I think. Is that it? No, where is it? Oh, where where is life? Isn't that it? Oh, I don't know what's going why I can't see it. Do I have it closed down or something? Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do now, right, guys, is I'm going to just let you hear a uh, sine wave, okay? So this is what he's talking about. That's A. Now I'm going to play double it, the octave above it, same note, but twice as high. So you can see there's double the number of frequencies. Okay, so double the way, four times away, double the length of string. You can hear when you play it together, they sound nice. So that's called consonant. And <laughs> by Pythagoras, that meant that you're, it's, it, it, it's good for your soul. It's purifying, healthy. Any deviation from that is unhealthy. So what he also found is that the fifth sounded nice. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that sounds nice, wholesome. He found that the fourth sounded nice. One, two, three, four. Yeah, sounds nice. But he found that the fourth and the fifth together didn't sound nice. Yeah. All right, my friends there, I was uh, rudely interrupted by some uh, teenagers there, so... We'll just do it again, okay? So, unison is, um, or sorry, the octave is consonant. Fifth, fourth, but the fourth and the fifth were dissonant. Close to the devil, Satan, it's evil, makes you feel bad. You will eventually become spiritually and physically ill from listening to this bad music. Okay? So, evil is things that are bad for you. Okay, we have to kind of recontextualize our language a little bit. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show you the, in, in the screen there, just what they were talking about when they're talking about uh, consonances and dissonances. And uh, what I'll try and do is go back now. Uh, we'll try, if I hit Command F, are we on the right page at all? I, are you even seeing that correctly? I don't even know. Oh, I see. No, I've moved it. It's good. Okay, so we'll go back now and we'll have a look at it. So so, so we were talking about Pythagoras there and he's, he's starting to figure out mathematical relationships to music. Okay, so for hundreds of years, this is what they do, how they organise music. And this is a killer picture here. This is my, my third favourite favorite picture. So if Toby is listening, this is my third favourite picture in all of music. Uh, he asked me what my second picture was. So we can see here the hammering, the blacksmith arts. We can see the different weights on the bells. We can see the monochord here. Or well, actually, it's not a monochord. It's a different strings of chord. And we can see the aur aur auroras, or however that's pronounced there. And so this is how they were taught up until the 1500s. That number, by Pythagoras, numbers in the heaven, uh, orbital mechanics, numbers in the 
stars. And we'll, uh, while we're at that, we will just talk a little bit about that because I think I have it here somewhere. Uh, and, uh, yeah, orbital resonance. Isn't just that a beautiful term? Orbital resonance. So this comes from Johannes Kepler. Uh, in celestial mechanics, orbital resonance currents where orbiting bodies exert regular periodic gravitational influence on each other. So he referenced uh, the movements of the planets to being like in harmony, the harmonic uh, orbital resonances. So I just thought, you know, just to show you that music is not just, it's more than notes on the page. It's more than, it's, it's more than pop music. It's more than that. OK, I don't think we'll go into this one. Uh, this, there's an interesting part on this, though, which uh, we, we'll look at quickly, OK? Just the way it says it. Throughout human, Western history, number has from time to time taken an important role in art, although never accepted by all artists of a given period and soon replaced by an alternative aesthetic theories. Mathematical explanations persistently and recurrently crop up in forms both old and new, sometimes based upon recently developed mathematical operations, I guess nowadays like AI, sometimes m uh, making ver uh, new applications of an old and so on. So I just wanted to point that out, that Pythagoras and music, and if you look them up, you'll find some interesting things. Uh, music and health, that's going to be Pythagoras as well. Uh, musical structure, I don't think we were looking at that one. So I'll continue on. Music and consciousness, this is all going to be when you look up uh, Pythagoras. So the music, rhythm and numbers in the Heraclitian River. Uh, okay. I like the way they describe it. So this is when they do describe ribbon, rhythm in Greece. So we've looked a little bit, we'll look a little bit more about the harmony. But when they describe ribbon, rhythm in Greece, this is what they say. This is from the school. Uh, um, this is from, um, it's going to be, uh, well, I don't know, it's... Um, an anonymous student, but it's probably going to be a fellow called Aristo uh, Zenos, who we might see in a minute. He's got an amazing name. Uh, his name, Ar Aristo, means best, and Zenos means foreigner or guest. So he's best guest. And he was a student of both the school of Pythagoras and Aristotle himself. And he wrote the first, basically, music theory book and book about... Um, uh, numbers and music and rhythm. So he talked about rhythm for the first time. And he said, we enjoy rhythm because it possesses number both familiar and ordered and moves us in an orderly way. For ordered movement is by nature more akin to us than disordered and indeed itself more natural. So ordered movement, one, two, three, four, and two, two, three, four, that's more natural of the body. Now we can see that unordered movement then would be less natural and might be more metaphysical beyond the physical. So unordered numbers are of interest in modern music, like prime numbers and things like this. Um, so rhythm means divi division by pattern. Um, it means quantized kind of slices of time. There's another little thing in here, but I don't like the font, so I'm going to burst it. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to listen to a couple of the early types of music. We listen to um, the very first. We hear it. These are the first words of the oldest Greek song and also the oldest preserved complete song, the epitaph of uh, Cyclos uh, on traditional instruments for a diatonic, uh, didactic class on ethnic traditional instruments. I'll we'll just zoom in here. Playing a lute there and a frame drum. video who knows okay so you can see there that it's greek instrumentation he's got the loose he's got the frame drum they're singing greek and that one i think is 3500 years old and when you hear the lyrics they're amazing while you live 
shine, have no grief at all. Life only exists for a short while and time demands his due. What? I mean, if that if you're going to have a first song, yeah, that's that's the one. So we're going to continue on with a little bit more. This man is going to tell us. So Michael Levy makes some really cool uh, music. He kind of experiments with this stuff. And we're just going to listen to him for a, few, for a minute or two here about the lute and about ancient Greek harmonies and harmonic structure of ancient the Greek tune, music. First of all, um, the actual tuning I'm going to be using. This is an authentic ancient Greek tuning. Um, first of all, the mode, the ancient Greek mode. So they invented uh, modes. This is called the Hypolydian mode, which is an equivalent... Sorry, just interestingly enough, there was a writer at the time who, you know, they were quite nationalistic at the time, city-states and all. There was a writer at the time who said there was only three legitimate modes, one for each of the ethnic groups in Greece at that time, which is interesting. Socrates said that the only mode of any value was the Phrygian. And I think a lot of people would agree with Socrates. The Phrygian, that's really beautiful. You start in E. There's a lot of Arabic music used the Phrygian. On the white notes of the piano. But there's a lot of music used a lot of chords. So this is F, tuning, so that's, a, that's um, um, Lydian. The lyre here is tuned to what you call, um, the ancients, how they, the ancients tuned their lyres and harps um, to just intonation. And the difference between just intonation and boring modern equal temperament is that in just intonation, um, the, all the pitches between the notes are precisely mathematically calculated. Um, so it's much purer sounding tuning. Closer to God, closer to health. Modern equal temperament is a horrible compromise. Everything is equally keys. out of tune. It's horrible. Um, but what's lost in that compromise is the purity of tone. Um, well, equal the best example of that, if you play a chord on a piano in equal temperament, there's this horrible wow, wow, wow. Sound Which I showed you, the dissonances. If you play a chord in pure, just intonation, you get this beautiful of sound which is absolutely lovely it's going to ring out last uh, longer and be pure sound um, sweeter the piece um, the ancient lyre great ancient Greek lyre playing techniques I'm going to use in my performance of the first Delphic hymn is the um, technique of string stopping on a diatonically strung lyre so that means seven seven notes the um, un unambiguous ancient Greek musical notation for the Delphic hymn You've got to actually use your knuckle as a fret on the string and to shorten its length um, by the required semitones indicated by the music. Let me just give you an example of um, the section of the hymn that uses this. As you can see, I'm using my knuckle of my thumb as a fret on the string to shorten the length to create the required semitones. Anyway, um, to hear a studio version of um, the Delphic Hymn on my lyre, um, please check out my quite frankly amazing album called The Ancient Greek Lyre. i got to be honest. It's iTunes, Amazon, as well as other... Um, I wonder why he doesn't name the, the other one. I won't name it either. But uh, it's very nice. He's a very good player. And he, what you could hear what he's saying about it being perfectly tuned. Okay, we're going to move it. There was equal, that was a significant difference in music that was mathematically tuned. So we're going to have another listen to an instrument here now. Um, this one is the Aurorus, I think, is it? The paean is the lengthiest and best preserved ancient example of ancient Greek song with the musical edition 127 BCE festival. Yeah, it's the Aurorus thing. Can't say it. it. Survives written on stone, stone slabs on the entrance to Delphic. There it is, look at that thing. So that, that in, it's written down that that would lead 15 men in a choir. Hark you, loud thundering Zeus's fair-armed daughters. Come with songs to celebrate your brother, Phoebus of the golden hair. Who ascending the twin peaks of Parnassus, the mountain's throne, accompanied by the fair famed Delphic maidens, reaches the Castella's flowing streams as he visits Delphi, his mountain oracle. This is significant to me. Delphi is an important place in the history of humanity, human thought. Above all else, know thyself. 
Okay, so I'm going to stop it there, my friends, okay? Um, and we're going to continue on to another one. So that's, that's what it sounded like, 127 BC. So this is the Aurora, Aurora's, and we're going to hear this song twice, and then we're going to see where it comes from, okay? So we're going to see two different versions of this song. It's meant for this instrument, but hearing it the other way will be... He does a great version of it. tens. So we've come far away now from our flute 40,000 years ago. We've got two of them now. <laughs> and we got sheet notation, but we don't have a huge amount about rhythm yet. It's a killer sound, isn't it? Barringer. Okay, I'm not going to talk about it for too long because, I don't know, you can watch it yourself, I guess. You can see the name of it there. Now we're going to go on to one of my favorite videos. I don't know what to show you. I think I'll show you this one because I just like it. This is the Hydralis, and the Hydralis is a water organ, and an organ is a very significant instrument in the development of harmonic analysis and harmonic theory. And so it's important to just see the first one. Uh, the first uh, the hydraulis maybe it'll say when the hydraulis is I don't want to give you the wrong date on the hydraulis no so we'll just quickly look up a hydraulis one second H-Y-D-R-A-E-L-I-S hydraulis it's a water organ Jesus can you not just give it to me in the first three, third century BC okay so 300 BC this, these types of things existed. I absolutely adore this instrument. We hear it's the same song, okay? It's part of my mind now, that song. I want to see the little, um, look at it, isn't it beautiful? Serious construction, I wouldn't be able to make it. I love this little fellow here now, there's a lovely, oh, look at the little dolphin. Isn't that lovely? Now this is pumped. So there's a, I don't know if you can see, but there is someone pumping it there. I'll, I'll just, I'll go to the other video because you can see he brings his, he brings his wife along with him. <laughs> And she, she pumps the organ. She pumps his organ. It'll stop now. <laughs> uh huh. Now, you could do that with your life if you want to. You can go around to festivals and dress up and play gorgeous music for people. Why not? So that's the, that's the hydraulis there, okay? Uh, we're going to find out now where they came from. They came from uh, Beller, Anonymous Bellarmani. The Anonymous Bellarmani is a collection of material music by one or more unknown authors transmitted by a number of Byzantine manuscripts and first published by Johann Friedrich Bellarmann, so Germany. It's drawn to marked extent from Aristonixus. We might see a little bit more about him. He's very important, actually, but contains some valuable matter not found elsewhere. Uh, the six, so, so that means that this comes from back then, you know, 127 BC and stuff. So, and we can see it uh, before I go to uh, Rex. Well, actually, no, we may as well because we're here now. Rex de uh, Zenus, we heard about him earlier. He uh, was born there in southern Italy and studied in Athens under Aristotle, uh, was interested in ethics and music, as you can see the connection there, and wrote much, but much of his work is lost, apart from his musical treaties, fragments, and various things. All right. But uh, this is an important thing for me. He said, Arrest, Arrestos Zenus held that the notes of the scale should not be judged by mathematical ratio, but by the ear. He maintained, his remaining musical treaties includes parts of this. So there's more to him now. I couldn't find it where I found the original information. But when I looked at him, I thought he was taking a more, what you'd call a phenomenological approach 
it's, it's, a, it's a contemporary word, but what it means is that interested in the phenomena and how it appears to us, how we sense the, uh, the sense reality and what that means to us rather than the mathematical rational relationship to it. So music has always had a, a, a difficult relationship with mathematics because we want it to align and to make sense. But when it lines, it doesn't sound very nice. So <laughs> when it's equally tempered, we do not get the pure harmonics, but we do our best. And so he's like, he's like, if you don't, it, the well-tempered clavier is basically what he's pushing for. OK, so we'll, we're going to get there. So right then it wasn't equally tempered. It was the modes and the restrict and you could only use so many of them. And you, very limited scales and you couldn't, because of the way their music is structured and the way the instruments were tuned, you couldn't get large orchestration because as instruments went higher up the ranges, they'd start to go out of tune and it was just a mess. You know, sym symphonic sounds having a large symphony or group of people playing songs together was a bit of a mess which we will see not th this video this video is nearly at an end my friends but we will go on and we will look we will end off and we'll look at Bellarmine's actual treaties so this is a transcription of uh, from the 18 I think it's 1841 or something like that from the 1841 book uh, Bellarmine's book and we can <coughs> which is a um, copy of the Aristo Xenesis transcripts about music theory from the Greek period of so we can see there and what I love about this I'll be honest is that I, I can play it like it's 2000 blah years old it's not hard to play oh I missed it sorry it's that's it You know, and then the next one is actually just one note up. So if we look at it, it's, it's a G A B. Sorry, I can't see. <laughs> Very nice. So, and that's, uh, you know, whatever time of period it is, you get it. So this is the very start of harmonic analysis. So I'm going to fly back through it again, all right, one, one last time. We'll start off and we'll try and look at uh, live here. We'll try and get a picture of live going, okay? We can see that they had identified the harmonic and they'd identified diatonic tones and pentatonic tones dividing the octave. into a range of notes. This is, you know, when you're on a pix, fixed instrument like a piano, the, you know, they're set or a string or something like that, like a, like a guitar. But with my voice, oh, it's all free, it's all the same, you know. So, so, so there's different pitches, okay? So we divide them into pitch classes. They'd written them down. They've given them names. They hadn't really developed rhythm. They had developed strict mathematical relationships uh, for, excuse me, they had developed strict mathematical relationships based on Pythagoras and other type of people around the time. And that the, these mathematical relationships were seen as, a, as an educational thing. They were kind of purifying to educate the mind that the good harmony would bring about a good thinking good soul, good, good, you know, you, you'd be a fine, upright citizen. And uh, so we started to develop these mathematical thinkings, the mathematical alignments, and it became an almost, uh, well, not almost, it was a religion, very much a religion. Uh, this uh, love of number and the, 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 the look for, there must be an original harmony, the one harmony, the great harmonic, the one harmony, the one that underlines all other things. If everything is in sympathetic resonance with everything else, then there's one underlying harmony, the singularity, okay? The monadic ideal. Now, 
uh, that's uh, that's a complicated thing to think about. But this is the way that people who are into music in a particular type of way, such as those that are going to be dealing with music theory and music and analysis and music harmony and this type of thing, they like music in a particular type of way. OK, so this is what I'm trying to do in this video, to try and introduce you to this form of thinking, OK, and to show you that music maybe is a little bit richer than what people think and, well, not maybe what people think, but I don't know what we're trying to do. A little bit, I'll go back to my image, I'll get out of this conversation, I'll go back to my image and I'll show that we're talking about some harmonic analysis. That's what we're doing, OK, and we're getting from here, all the way here, all the way, all the way to here. We haven't made it here yet. So in the next video, what we were doing today is this, okay? So what I was trying to do today was to show you some of the ancient periods, cultural riches, communication, storytelling, technological inventions, economic factors. I was trying to show you some of the early developments, ritual appreciation of music. And I think what I'll do is I'll just, I think just to end it off, my friends, I'm going to end it off with just that, if I can find it. The lovely, uh, the lovely... Um, saying there oh yeah while you live shine have no grief at all life exists only for a short while and time demands is due okay my friends that's it for harmonic analysis uh for the prehistoric and the greek ages in the next video i think we'll be looking at the medieval appreciation of harmonics okay my friends thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed it if you did like subscribe do all that good stuff and tell me that i'm a superhero down in the comments all right bye now